we made reinforced concrete beams in our lab to see how much load will these things carry and how will they break. So we went through the whole fabrication process, tying our rebar cages, oiling up the forms, dropping the cages into the forms, and now we have six beams ready to cast. So of course, what is reinforced concrete without the concrete? We've got to fill our forms and also check the slump to make sure that everything is looking good, casting some cylinders to check the strength and vibrating everything into place, putting on the finishing touches and then curing for seven days. When we pull it out of the forms, here is the final product ready to test under our actuator. Let's look at the results of these tests and see how they work. Before we break that first beam, let's check out our testing setup. So our main load is gonna be applied by our actuator. Let's call that load P. And it's going to be divided in half by our spreader beam, which results in equal reactions on the two sides, P over two. Now the whole beam is six feet long with two foot segments. So if we look at the demands, our shear demand is going to be constant P over two at the two ends with zero shear in the middle. And our moment is going to have a constant moment region in the middle. And if we multiply that all out, that's just a moment of P in units of kip feet. Now our first beam is going to have eight inch spacing of number three stirrups and our longitudinal bars are two number three bars. So relatively lightly reinforced. Let's see what happens. First thing I'll note is that beam testing is a little bit like watching paint dry. So I've sped this up by about 20 times. Actual test took about five minutes to do. The first thing that we'll notice is that we have flexural cracking in this center flexural region. And that's on the tension side because of course concrete is not very good at tension. What develops next is some crushing in the compression region, and that's gonna take us to the end of this beam. It's a very ductile failure. This is the kind of failure we want to see with our beams. Beam one ultimately held about 12 kips of load. That's about 53 kilonewtons for you folks in metric. We see that this has a very characteristic ductile failure where we go up to the yielding point where the flexural bars yield, and then we have a long plateau where we have a lot of displacement, but not much increase in load. So again, this is an ideal failure that we want to see in our beams because it gives us a lot of warning if we have a problem. Moving on to beam two, we figure some steel is good, more steel is better. So we've increased our flexural steel up to three number three bars. So that's a 50% increase over beam one. Stirrup spacing is the same. Let's see what happens. Things start out the same as beam one, but pretty soon we'll see some flexural cracking develop in that center flexure region on the bottom where we have our highest tension. That is going to develop then into crushing in our compression region. This compression block completely separates from the beam below it. Comparing beam two to beam one, we see that one extra bar does give us some extra capacity, but not 50% more as we would expect. So our new capacity is 16 kips. That's about 71 kilonewtons. We see our capacity drops off pretty sharply here. That's where that compression block separated from the rest of the beam, but we still see some reasonable ductility with this beam. So let's move on to our next test. So some steel good, more steel better. Let's just keep going with that. Let's add much more flexural steel. Now I've upped that to two number six bars. So that's doubling the radius of that bar, which means I have four times as much steel in this beam as compared to beam one. However, I got rid of my stirrups because who needs those things anyway? Let's just see what happens. Here we go, applying some load. There really isn't much to see just yet and that's not too surprising. Hey, wait a second. Let's take another look at that. Oh, there we go. Now, believe it or not, we actually suddenly lost all of our capacity just right there with the formation of this diagonal crack extending from the support. This is known as a shear failure, and it's on account of the fact that I got rid of all those stirrups. So maybe we do need those after all. Okay, so we probably need some stirrups. Let's increase that just a little bit for beam four. Same flexural steel as beam three, so two number six bars. Let's see what happens now. Just a hunch, but I kind of think this beam is going to do the same thing. Let's find out. Yep. Something just, oh, there it goes.
So once again, we have a large diagonal crack extending through the entire section. In this case, it started from where I applied my load, but that's because that entire end region has constant shear, so it could start either at the load or at the support. So we saw both beams three and four had these really dramatic shear failures with the diagonal crack, and we can see from the results that our capacity is not actually any better for having the two number six bars compared to the number three bars. So bigger bars isn't really helping us, and that's because we got rid of a lot of those stirrups. So our shear capacity is controlling here, and that shear failure is very brittle. That is something that we do not want to see in our beam design because this gives no warning for failures. It would be much better to have, for example, beam number two in this situation has slightly higher capacity and much more ductility. All right, so that still didn't really solve my problem, but we'll try it just one more time. Two number eight bars, this now has seven times the area of my beam one. However, I still have that light stirrup spacing. Let's just see what happens. Do you get the feeling that I don't have a lot of confidence in this beam? Yeah, number eight bars, it's a pretty big bar, but it's not really gonna help us that much compared to the number six, but it's always interesting to, oh no, that's not good. Zooming in on that, we notice that this is some sort of anchorage and shear failure combined. So by anchorage, notice that our bar there is not embedded in any concrete anymore. And it just pulled out. That is the end of the bar. It did not break. So effectively that crack went through pure concrete with no steel to intercept that large crack. And we have a very brittle failure in consequence. All right, I've learned my lesson. We need the stirrups. The stirrups are very important to carry our shear demand. So let's try one last time. This has got to be the strongest beam that we are going to test. So two number eight bars once again, but now I have a four inch stirrup spacing. Haven't tried that yet. Let's just give it a shot. So I have a bit more confidence in this one. Yes, we have a lot of flexural reinforcement, but we also have the stirrups for the shear reinforcement. So hopefully we will not see the same kind of failure again, except we just saw the same kind of failure again. Not quite as dramatic, but again, we have this anchorage and shear failure at the end, and we're not really engaging all of our steel in the beam. Looking at the results from all six tests, we can see that beam five, again, really didn't do any better than the previous beams. And in fact, the capacity is about the same as beam two, except that we had another brittle failure. Now beam six, we had a lot of promise with that, a lot of steel, two number eight bars, four inch stirrup spacing. Again, it still had the same issue. We had this anchorage failure at the end, and once those bars kind of pull out, I don't really have any steel in that region, and so then I just get this sheer anchorage cracking there at the end. So again, out of all these beams, I really like beam number two. It has almost the maximum capacity, but it has far more ductility than all the beams that have failed in shear. Now, yes, we can make some improvements to beam two. First of all, I would decrease that stirrup spacing down to four inches. ACI 318 requires us to have a spacing of D over two or less, and D is about eight and a half inches. So four inches sounds pretty good to me. Next, I would probably increase that flexural steel up to three number four bars. That's a small improvement from the three number threes, but it puts us at around a 1% reinforcement ratio. It's gonna get us a little bit more capacity out of this, and it's gonna be a little bit more of an efficient beam. A few takeaway messages for what we learned from breaking these beams. Now first, we prefer flexural failures over brittle shear failures. So the flexural failure, we can see it coming. We have a lot of ductility and it's much more predictable. Second, more steel is not always better. There is an efficient range of steel where we can yield those bars in flexure, and that encourages our ductility without getting these brittle failures. So sometimes just adding more steel is not going to be the answer. Third, if you can get away with it, and if you can have similar areas of bars, smaller bars are going to anchor better than larger bars. So a very large bar, you're much more likely to have anchorage problems and development problems, whereas a small bar, it's gonna be better at controlling your cracks and better at anchoring at its ends. So as always, I hope you learned something from these tests. If you like this videos, please, of course, hit that like button and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.